this, this lecture, um, if I'm in a terribly good mood, can go for two hours. So um, I, I'm going to try to get through it in, in one hour. Um, and I want to give you a, a little bit of an outline of um, how it's going to go. I'm going to start with a preamble, uh, then a section called theory, then a section called examples, then a section called tools, and then a section called lessons and hopes. So um, I hope to take you through a journey that's uh, a part of a the book that uh, Alex mentioned uh, called Relationism, Architecture Beyond Experience. I know that that's a very, very ambitious title. What costs possibly could be beyond experience? Um, for architects, uh, the experience of a building is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. It is the final critique. It's what all the other critiques of what architecture does are supposed to resolve itself. What's it like to be there? What is the experience? Um, I think that's because we're part of an experiential culture. We're part of a culture that, where the new wealth is in fact the diversity and richness of your experience. And I think that architecture to some extent has um, been sucked into uh, that uh, concept. So let me just start with um, what I'm calling a preamble and give you a feeling for where this is going. At roughly three decade intervals, architecture changes its reigning metaphors. Uh, I don't know if that's a matter of just intellectual fashion or just straight fashion. But beyond the, uh, the categories of moder modernism and postmodernism and deconstructivism and all the isms that we as architects know about, there are other metaphors that are sort of running our thinking. For example, architecture is a machine. It's called the machine analogy, right? Architecture is an organism. So we use nature, uh, nature as the model. Architecture is landscape. I'd say at my school, maybe here, this is the dominant metaphor. We treat buildings as though they were landscapes. And we become very interested in f making roofs that flow into the ground, burying buildings under the ground, thinking of space as sort of uh, as an open terrain, talking about junctures and events and so forth, and doing everything we can to translate architectural things into landscape uh, things. There was also uh, architecture as a language, which was dominant through, I'd say, the 60s through the 80s. Uh, architecture speaks, architecture has meaning. Uh, that too is a metaphor that's come and gone. There is another metaphor, though, which I my entire talk, of which this is a preamble, um, is based on. And that is the idea that architecture as being, B-E-I-N-G, architecture as being. The architecture as being metaphor, now I'm going to read just a little. The architecture as being metaphor operates still, but not openly. It produced what Jeffrey Scott called the architecture of humanism in a 1914 book of the same name. On this metaphor, buildings, or rather works of architecture, have character. They have presence. They have posture. They live and breathe and project attitude. They have rights. They stake claims. They have feelings. And they have souls. And of course, they have bodies. Indeed, it is mostly through their bodies, their stances, poses, physiques, and how they look in both senses of the word look, that buildings tell us what their attitudes and feelings are about being beings in the world, creatures in the most general sense. This is why we can still ask whether this or that work of architecture is hostile or friendly confident or shy, honest or disingenuous, generous or miserly, respectful or cheeky, indifferent or eager to please. We might see it as shorn or adorned, clean or dirty, tailored or disheveled, quiet or loud. We can ask how and why is this building muscular and articulated and that one soft and smooth, 
Why is this one delicate and that one rugged? This one loved and that one neglected? This building strains to hold a difficult pose. That one dances with ease. This building sits comfortably in its skin. That one squirms uncomfortably as they're trying to get out of its clothes. All this is projection, of course, empathy, or Einfühlung, as Theodor Lips called it. Buildings don't really do any of these things. But then so too are all the other metaphors I mentioned, language, machines, organisms, landscapes. They too are metaphors, they too are projections. But there's a fundamental difference between those metaphors and thinking of buildings as beings. Because when you think of a building as a being, uh, the metaphor is fundamentally ethical. And that is the difference between these. Why is building as being ethical? Because there exists an essential anti-reductive rule to the ethical life, as it is practiced by humans. And that rule, stated broadly, is this. To treat stones like plants, to treat plants like animals, to treat animals like humans, to treat strangers like friends, and friends like family, to treat family like your own self, and yourself as a spluttering flame of the divine, the bringer of greater life to all participants in the great chain of being. All architecture in behalf of life is ecological, to be sure, but nature's crowning achievement is human consciousness, the very consciousness that you and I look at the world with and through in order to realize humanity's special responsibility to and increasing responsibility for all life. To address this responsibility requires that we find the energy to do so. And so we must address first the human spirit, ours and everyone else's. We can only do this when we uphold our own dignity and that of others, and this involves, because we are architects, making buildings whose character embodies the virtues and attitudes we would want everyone to have, including ourselves. Questions about intention, character, values, and feelings conveyed or embodied by works of architecture are, alas, almost as complex as they are in human psychology. This applies not only to Greek and Renaissance architecture, but to modern architecture too. Certainly, you cannot understand Le Corbusier until you see his buildings as animals or humans, mostly females. Nor can you understand great modern architects' works like James Sterling or Louis Kahn or Frank Gehry, whose buildings so clearly strut or stand witness or swirl. One does not simply look at these buildings as abstract compositions. One feels what it would be like to be them, standing, moving, gesturing, posing, posturing. And I mean the buildings, not the architects. Here are some illustrations of what I had in mind. It's okay to laugh in acknowledgement of the body imagery, consciously or unconsciously deployed by these architects. It's exciting and a bit embarrassing. We should let that laugh settle. Let it settle into a Buddha smile that comes from realizing that it's the humanness of architecture's very being that's smiling at you. Fred and Ginger by uh, Frank Gehry. What could it possibly mean for architecture to be beyond experience? This is a, what's called a sky space, uh, one of several by the artist uh, James Terrell. Um, it's on the campus of my university, as a matter of fact. Uh, a simple oval with a circle cut to the sky. You sit in that space, you watch the sky go by. It feels very uh, spiritual, or it's intended to feel very spiritual. Clearly, divinity is up there in the sky, and that's where you commute. But if we actually go, uh, this is what you find. You find very, very poorly dressed people, uh, mostly trying not to look at the other people, or looking at their iPhones, um, 
and generally just like not getting the space at all, but sort of being in it. And I became sort of interested in the social dynamic that's going on here. So for me, this is a picture of the th a theory of divinity, so to speak, which is about the sky, but an actual presence or absence of divinity, if you will, in human relation, which is what I became interested in. Why am I so interested in that? Well, because of this book by a philosopher named Martin Buber called I and Thou. And uh, another book which is very influential in me called Consciousness and the Social Brain. I'm not going to have time to tell you what Michael Graziano says, but I'll give you in a nutshell what he says. We would not be conscious if we did not socialize. That is, we do not exist as individuals and then communicate with each other. We don't even know we exist until we are communicating and reacting to other people socially. That is a neurological and developmental fact. So, in fact, experience depends on relation and not the other way around. That's what Graziano says, and if you read my book someday, you'll, you'll, you'll read about that in full. A movement in aesthetics called Relational Aesthetics by Nicolas Bourillon, also uh, very influential for me. Um, the Political Ecology of Things, Vibrant Matter. And this book, which really, really turned my head around about this, by uh, Michael Merrill, called uh, about Louis Kahn's unbuilt uh, Dominican mother house. And I will actually be showing plans of this building, trying to interpret some of it for you, so that I can sort of convey to you where I think uh, this line of thinking goes. All right, so let's do some theory. Um, let's see, we can just start with some sort of feeling that there's order out there. Uh, one might uh, ascribe that to God or to nature or to the Tao or to Brahman or something. Somehow from that emerges what I'm going to put into three categories. People, objects, and rooms. Now, if we're going to talk about relationships as I am, since everything is, you could have billions of relationships between billions of things. This is a categories, categorization which is um, hopefully going to be useful to architects. So, among people and animals, one set, objects to objects, rooms to rooms, and spaces to spaces. Now, the humanist point of view says, or the relational point of view says, we learn to be conscious from the top one, people to people, people to animals, and animals to animals. All other relationships that we see between things are actually mappings of that. Right? And I'm going to be arguing, in fact, for applying social intelligence and social categories to the arrangement of furniture in a room, to the arrangement of people in the room, the arrangement of buildings to buildings, and the arrangement of rooms to rooms. I'm going to talk about Louis Kahn's saying, a plan is a society of rooms, and suggest to you that that is actually a very, very profound insight about architecture that should change how we design. Now, Martin Buber's usefulness here is the following. He said, there are fundamentally two attitudes between, I think he meant people here mostly, but he also talked about our relationship to animals and things like trees and so forth. They can be I, it, which he thought of as like one word, I, it, it names a relationship, where the other is objectified, and I, you. In I, you, the relationship to the other is, um, well, I'm going to have to read to you a little bit about it. So this will be my second reading, and then I'm going to babble on myself. This is, these are the words of Martin Buber. To man, and he means people, but he wrote this in 1929, to man, the, word, the world is twofold in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words that he speaks. The primary words, these are them, are not isolated but combined words. The one is the combination I you, the other is the combination I it wherein without any change, one of the words he 
and she can replace it. Hence the eye of man is also twofold, for the eye of the primary word I you is different from the eye of the primary word I it. So those are Buber's words, and then these are mine. Every phenomenon, physical, chemical, biological, and social, derives from bonds, from relationships. And in the human world, it is no different. Except that the attitudes I, you, and I, it form the bonds, the relationships foundational to all others. There can be no I without a you or it to relate to, no you or it without an I to make it so. I, you, and I, it are thus the two primary words uttered by consciousness. I-it relationships are the ones that result from one person regarding another, or a person, or an animal, or an inanimate object, as a means to an end. These ends may be one's own, or societies, or even gods, no matter. As its, others are assessed, objectified. They are judged to be well-formed or not, useful or not, suitable or not, edible or not. They are judged intelligent or dull, functional or problematic, amenable or bothersome. The I-it attitude and the relationships that come from it are not morally bad. They can be good or bad. In fact, they're essential to the running of our economy. We all agreed to become its for certain others some of the time. An employer to an employee, a business partner to a business partner, an actor to an audience, a service provider to a client, and so forth. And we treat many others as I-its ourselves. There is no blame here except that I-it tends to crowd out and dominate I-you, which is just as essential but more fragile. In I-it relationships, one person pushes another's buttons, stimulus and response. People expect things from each other and respond to one another by virtue of their roles and positions in society, like a game that everyone plays ideally by the rules, even if those rules are being made up. In I-it relationship, there is no interest in what the other is really thinking, beyond the fact that it allows one to work with them more effectively. One transacts. As it's, others are there to give you pleasure, and you them. They are there to give you information, rights, money, help, and so on. I-it relationships also allow us to accept others' poses and appearances, without thinking of them as lies. With the I-you attitude, on the other hand, and with relationships that follow from sustained I-you attitudes, one cannot see the other as an object or tool or entertainment. To look into another's eyes is to look through the night of their pupils into a sort of infinity. It is to address them fearfully or lovingly, but in any case, fragilely, it is to say, you matter to me, and I think I matter to you. It is to say, I acknowledge the immensity in you, an immensity in you, equal to the immensity I feel in myself. I recognize your freedom as I recognize my own, your fears almost as I do my own, your dreams almost as I do my own. Contrary to philosophers following Kant who argue that indifference or non-involvement is essential to aesthetic enjoyment. Aesthetic enjoyment does not vanish when adopting the IU attitudes. It just occurs differently, better able to get past superficial ugliness, better to ride swells of emotion. Think of Rembrandt's self-portraits. Think of Van Gogh's. Who are they looking at and why? IU relationships cannot be seen from the side. They address the whole of our beings and they block out the world, if only for an instant. Are they rare? Not at all. Every genuine hello and every genuine goodbye is an I-U utterance which briefly performs the magic. And so we might say hello to a cat as it turns toward us. We might say hello to a praying mantis, a sapling, or a building, meaning I recognize the you-ness of you and in some way that you experience me in your subjectivity, such as it maximally can be. We regard each other, we are in dialogue. In I, it, people deal with each other. In I, you, they meet. You go to an aquarium, 
an, an enormous old turtle glides by and you hold eye contact for three long seconds. You're exhilarated. Do you say later, and there was this turtle? Or do you say, I met this turtle? At some level, of course, you simply did experience the turtle, inasmuch as it passed in and out of your vision, leaving a trace in your mind like a small movie reel. You might also have classified it as beautiful or ugly, or beautifully ugly, uh, as foreign and familiar, and so on. Grasping for words. But if something else passed between you in that three seconds, call it an understanding, an opinion, a recognition, then something more has happened in the world than two experiences in two brains. What happened was more like a momentary reconfiguration of the world itself. What happened was a single invent, an encounter, as Buber would say, in which everything physical, from the layout of the aquarium to the rays of light that joined the turtle's fovea to yours, played a role. A hunter of old kneels over an animal he has slain. Forgive me, he whispers. This is I, you. Looking up, the hunter offers a prayer of thanks. This may or may not be I, you. He stands up to think about how to get the carcass home. This is I, it. OK. So that's a set of ideas largely uh, about interpersonal ideas or between living things. Uh, and my interest has been, and it will be for the rest of the lecture, how to tra transcribe these into architectural terms. On the metaphor that, that buildings are beings and that rooms are people, which I know sounds a little far-fetched, uh, but if, you, if, you, if this begins to enter your thinking, you will find that all of your social intelligence will emerge uh, into the realm of physical design. And I think some of the great architects have crossed that barrier and have understood that, and I'm going to try to show that in a little bit. If you live in an I-it world, two things come out of that. And these actually are Buber's terms. In I-it, we use things and we experience things. And when I first read that, I was quite startled. What? Because I'm actually into experience. If you've read me before, I, I, I talk about experience. And here was Buber saying, you know what? Experience is it. Experiences can be commodified. They can be made into movies. They can be bought and sold. They can be traded. You can make stories out of experiences. You can treasure, you can hoard them. They are actually, and our culture is, is, is hell-bent to find ways to make experience an object or a thing that can be bought and sold. Um, so we're accustomed, if we're all modernists here, the, we understand that use as a value leads to functionalism. Form follows function, how do you, you know, uh, the high performance building, when we talk about performance, we really are gonna talk about use of it. And if we can extend it to experience, we feel like the job is done. But in fact, when I talk about architecture beyond experience, I'm trying to tap into the IU attitude towards the world, from people to each other, to the world, and between rooms and spaces and buildings themselves, okay? So architecture beyond experience for me is a, a word I want to use now is relationism, and ultimately architecture in the second person. Architecture in the second person is what you feel when you say hello to a building, and you say goodbye when you leave it. Some examples. Um, this is, uh, these are four Japanese researchers that have a baby panda in that box. Um, they are dressed in panda suits because pandas should never see a human being. If a panda sees a human being, uh, they freak out and leave. So these men do this ridiculous thing where they dress in panda suits with a panda in that box because they then take it from the zoo back into, into the world. Um, 
and they are thinking about the panda. In other words, their consciousness, they are, they are, well, I'm, I'm, I'm over-describing it. You get the idea. This is a very simple building. It's actually in my hometown, which uh, I wouldn't say is great architecture, but actually I think is great architecture. It's a, it's a nature center. Uh, and I became, and I remain, totally fascinated not only by the uh, suggestion of human use given by the table, the chair that gets the view, but the way nature outside is both framed, contained, absorbed, and allowed in and put into a mural in this wall. I know this architecture is homely from a, a purely architect's sort of point of view, but actually I think it's a tremendous success and the building itself is a success uh, in those terms. I would claim to you it matters a great deal. Buber, you should know, thought that the IU relationship was in fact that all IU relationships uh, converged on the divine. He thought that's how God entered the world. God enters the world through IUness or IU relationships. So for him, uh, and that's roughly where I'm going with relationism. What are the alternatives? This is William Blake's uh, depiction of God as the architect. Um, here's a building that William Blake would have liked. Uh, as any number of churches, it's actually a church in, uh, in uh, north of Dallas, built out of dry stack limestone. Um, but that, that is the architect's approach to where the divine is. Not the only. Uh, this is um, in uh, Thailand. Uh, the, you can see the building and the body and the total order uh, given in this uh, Buddhist sect in Thailand. A familiar picture, the worship of the body. On the right, uh, the Leicester Engineering Building by James Sterling. On the left, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, roughly the same period. I find the coincidence here is just almost more than I can bear, including the sucked-in stomach and the, uh, and the antenna on the top. But the, the idea that buildings should be all muscle, no fat, right? It's right there for you. We're not really conscious of it. A photographer that I admire, and many, many of you admire, Henri Cartier-Bresson, when you start looking at his work through relational eyes, uh, and maybe, yeah, let's leave it at that, uh, you'll notice how many of his photographs involve pairs, two. Two people, two people in some sort of relationship to each other. These two here, those two there, these couples, this kid leaning on there, these people transacting, these two. Here's some more pictures, all by Cartier-Bresson. He never, never does a portrait of one person. That person, that. This person, that. This little proud kid, those two. This woman, her servant. This guy looking through, that. These two prostitutes. You're always asked to think about two. You can't have relationship without two. Two-ness is the fundamental step. Here at um, uh, Longchamp by Le Corbusier, many people have remarked that, that, that you know, the, the roof looks like a nun's hat, etc. It's a little rarer to think about uh, these two, the, two ch the three chapel spaces, these two at the back door and the one, the mother superior one, which is at the front door. It's palpable when you go there to feel the presence of these things. Um, this is a sculpture, this is actually my hometown by Thomas Friedman. This is a stainless steel 35 foot tall man looking at the sun next to a bunch of palm trees. Um, Cartier-Bresson again, Matisse and his doves, uh, Brancusi and his own sculptures, this man, another, and his shadow, this person, and that. So this is the Kimball Art Museum. 
The Kimball Art Museum is one of the great buildings in the world by Louis Kahn. This is uh, its front porch. Uh, as you also know, Renzo Piano has done an addition to the Kimball Art Museum. It is across the way from this, and there it is on the left. That building is actually across the street. This is Renzo Piano's building here. And I wanted to compare the way that these two buildings address each other. The uh, Kahn building is half the size of this, but the way it addresses the world with its open vault, its water, these benches, is so generous and so outgoing and so flow forward. You can see this building is uh, almost frightened. Look at these benches here, glued up against that. This extremely high-tech ceiling, and um, these columns like pushed up against the wall. It's really, really odd to be there and see the immense power of the Khan building, as delicate as it is and as small as it is, against this uh, frightened battleship, which is over here. When you're inside this uh, much lauded building, look at um, Look at the sort of the blankness of this expression. Uh, the fact that the skylight, the very, very high-tech skylighting, has just been turned into a kind of a factory system for general lighting. There's nothing human about it. Whereas, when I ask, who are these guys looking at? When you're at the Kimball, you know that you are being addressed by the building. This, this is uh, back at the piano edition. Um, Le Corbusier in uh, Chandigarh. It's not, a, it's not a mistake or a coincidence that the, this came from a local power station. This stuff here is coming from the uh, turbines. These colors came from the clothes of the people around. Uh, this roof is also from the headpiece. There's a natural tendency for people to see, read people into buildings. It's something that we suppress a great deal as modernists and technologists. In fact, we, we try to erase that because we think it's sort of childish, but the great uh, modern architect was fully capable of doing that. Or take this uh, a gr granary, also in Texas, just a wonderful social ensemble uh, of pieces that architects absolutely envy. Uh, the statues of Easter Island. Uh, if you've been to the Salt Museum by Louis Kahn, there's a powerful feeling that these towers are looking out the ocean with the same sense of expectancy, the same mute expectancy as the, uh, the statues of Easter Island. This is um, Louis Kahn at Dakar. This is one tiny little unit of that building. And from that, here's the building. You'll notice how there's a central space. Everything else around it is collected. Everything is, even this circle is, a, is split into two and addresses itself. Um, this is tr plan is truly, I think, a society of rooms. Now, some tools. In order to sort of uh, try to make some progress with this idea in an analytical way, um, here there are, there are some tools, um, and uh, digital tools to, to boot. Uh, this is called, these are called isovists. And if you Google isovists, you'll find several thousand references to work done, uh, developed by myself and some colleagues. Um, Wherever you move in space, you can only see a certain amount of space. That space that you can see at any given time has a shape, and it has uh, a character. And as you move, as this person moves through this environment, you can see it changing. Here's another person going the other way, and if you put them both together, you can tell by the end what has been seen by one of them, what has been seen by both of them, and what has been seen by none of them. 
And there is also a moment here where they see each other. And that is a critical moment. Or take an example like this. These are, these are, that's a view from that chair. You can see it's shaded there. And there's that chair. These two, sitting in that chair, you will see exactly the same thing even though those rooms are quite, quite different. If you took a photograph from here and took a photograph from there, it would look identical to you. Now, how is that different to that? Well, because we have a, a plan's eye view of it, uh, we can tell. This is, has high symmetry, axes. Um, you can this person can relate to this room. This room because it has some of the features of a body, actually has existence as an other. This space has no existence as an other. It is disorganized, it is fractured, it has no self-possession. So, there can be no relationship between this person and this arrangement. Well, you can have some, obviously, uh, compared to this. When you leave this room, when you get up from that chair, you know where you are in that room. You know that you're off center. You know when you're in it, and you know when you're out of it. That is a social model of relationship uh, between people or between living things. Uh, this is uh, Soane's Museum, uh, John Soane's house in London. Very, very famous building. It's been studied using Isovis. These are some uh, what's called isovist fields where agents are allowed to move around the space. And what we're seeing here is the sum of the space they can see. So this is all this, there are so many mirrors in the Sohn Museum that what we're seeing here is all the space that's visible in mirrors. So what we're having, what we're seeing mapped here is like another higher level analysis of spatial perception. It's still not relational, but it forms the basis of it. Now, <coughs> in order to study architecture relationally, we've got to do two things. One is, we've got to look at how people form around each other, as we are in this room right now. Why are you all facing this way? You know, why are these ch chairs in, a, in an arc? If you put people out in the open field, they behave like magnets. They orient themselves to each other, regardless of the architecture. Sometimes the architecture helps, sometimes the architecture hinders. So here are these kids, what's keeping them together? You can literally map the visibility field of that newspaper. They are all, in fact, it's the cosine, there's a, I can show you the math for it. That's what's holding them together in a magnetic field, like an information field. But the fact is that between people, there are glances and gazes happening all the time. Your eyes are moving around, but you cannot see other people's gazes. But we know exactly where people are looking. If you ride a bicycle, you know you can look through a windshield and tell whether the driver has seen you or not at a distance of 60 feet. We are unbelievably good at seeing where people are looking. And Graziano says that that's the first step of consciousness, is watching where other people are watching. Our sensitivity to other people's gaze. So you can start with a map like this, or like this. So we can just like look at this and tell the story of what's going on here. These four guys, this guy is unwanted because this guy is, he's looking at the side of him, he's looking at his hand. These two are very studiously looking away and he's covering his, his, his head, right? So we have, we have architecture, some architect put a bench here, um, but something else is going on on top of that architecture, which is what I'm calling the fabric of glances. That is, and there are rules to the fabric of glances. Um, this was a fascinating one. Can anyone guess what might be going on here? You probably can't. I couldn't. 
this is actually a massive argument going on. There's someone off, off the picture that he is arguing with. Half the people are looking at the person who's there. Some, most of the people are looking at him, and some people are just like looking uh, everywhere but. So th this is actually a, a pretty fine game. Uh, it's hard to find architecturally organized ones unless they are the product of dance, in which human figures are choreographed. But this is an interesting one. This is Emperor Hirohito. Near the end of the Second World War, they killed all the animals in their zoos uh, because they were taking up eating food. They saved one animal, this chimpanzee, because he was so entertaining. And in order to, um, <laughs> in order for PR's sake, he had himself photographed with this, with this circus chimp. The gest they have perfect eye contact. The chimp is gesturing with his hand. We don't know what for, but really, this is what's going on in their minds. And this is President Obama bowing to Asimo, the, uh, the Sony robot. I find, I find the tissue of glances or the fabric of glances here absolutely fascinating. He's got eye contact with the eyes. The floor is demarcated as to where Asimo cannot move. Uh, these positions were, uh, I think, where they were supposed to be standing. Things got a little sort of out of hand. One can generalize this just a little bit further. These are called attention fields. And they talk about every person has around them a probability of where they're looking, depending on their head and their shoulders. So and how you move your eyes relative to your head and shoulders. This is like the magnetic field of people. That's two people, three people. And when they start to form in groups, in conversational groups, they form a very, very intense uh, attention field between. Such as, for example, that. It's one of the primary forms of human-formed architecture. In rugby, in football, any game or in a, at a cocktail party, the architecture is not made by buildings. The architecture is made by other people's bodies and other people's heads. And we maneuver ourselves around so that we can have views, windows, and contact with each other. I'm interested in that architecture. This is when that group gets bigger. This is a quartet with an audience watching it. And this is actually a cocktail party uh, mapped from a photograph of a cocktail party, where ev everyone's shoulders, heads, and eyes are being very carefully mapped. You can look at this for 15 minutes and figure out who's just coming, who's a stranger, who's popular, who's not, who came with who, just from their body. This is architectural space, a little bit like John Soane's museum, Except instead of being transcribed into buildings, here it is, like with human attention. The idea, the dream, is that one day, when we are able to think about buildings as people and rooms as people, uh, mappings like this, mappings like this will matter. Here's Cartier-Bresson with groups again. Uh, Luigi Morandi, a great painter of still lives. People have often asked, what is, what's so fascinating about Mirandi's still lives? I would claim these are actually all family portraits. No different to that. In fact, you can see him arranging these bottles as mom, dad, uncle, kids, uh, lower things in front, and so forth. This is uh, Vatican ra the Vatican Radio Building. It's a kind of architecture which if we show this in architecture school, especially in a history class, you know, we're apt to talk about the windows and the walls and the uh, proportioning systems or I don't know what else. But in fact, this is a wonderful assembly of people uh, with entrances, individual entrances, with individual faces. These things are shoulder to shoulder. They are in, they are in, very, they are in good company. This is a, a this is a picture of a group of people no different from the Mirandi slide. 
In fact, the entire gesture of St. Peter's can be read uh, socially. So here's the, the, the Mother House by Louis Kahn. He never, it never was built, but it has this absolutely remarkable quality of uh, the nuns' rooms in a courtyard and all the public buildings, the classroom, the refectory, the church, in this what appears to be a sort of a jumble, uh, corner to corner. Of course, it's not a jumble. If you look very carefully, there are only a few alignments at work there. But what, what Kahn was doing here was something, I think, absolutely amazing. We end every room, first of all, is stated twice. There's a room around the outside, which allows movement. Uh, and then there is a corner condition. You move through the corner condition, and that is repeated all the way around the room. So that you move from world to world. Every world is total, complete in itself, but all the transitions are handled so that to, sit, to move from one to the other or to see from one to the other is to be reoriented. And I think that's exactly what people are like. I think to enter another or to relate to another is to some sense be twisted, to be twisted with respect to the world. And it's quite different to how we organize buildings as modernists, where we think of space as universal and we think of private space as dividing universal space in the most efficient way possible. I know that if we thought through these things um, in a more relational manner, um, we would have a richer architecture for it. <coughs> this is the model. So this is an early Frank Gehry building. It's called the Winton Guest House. Frank Gehry's insight was to try to make buildings out of individual spaces. He's actually said, my buildings are a cocktail party. He literally thinks of them as a cocktail party. And it's really not that hard to see, nor is it that hard to see how much they've been drinking. <laughs> the very first architecture I would suggest to you is, is your mother specifically your mother's body. And uh, I was struck by this particular set of images of a very, very poor woman on the street. This is in Sao Paulo, whose legs are spread on the pavement, who has next to her a box and a blanket and a few things. And those children are occupying the space of her arms, legs, shoulder, and what have you. This protective gesture is fundamental it's relational, and I would suggest, in some sense, beyond experience. Animals understand it. Architects understand it. This is La Tourette by Le Corbusier. Scarpa understood it. Kahn understood it. This is an early sketch of a Kimball. which we always interpret as a kind of some kind of lighting trick, which it is not at all. OK, some lessons, some hopes. What is, what, if you, if you are interested in this idea, what should you not do? Maybe I'm talking to the students now. Don't do this. This is Miss van der Rohe's brick house. It was specifically about not having a front, back, sides, having universal space, not being able to relate to it. Literally, do not relate to me. Don't do this. This is Herzog and de Moran doing Sana. Same deal. Um, it's a space without beginning, middle, end, center, use, or human um, occupation, to use conventional terms. Don't do this. This is uh, a terminal in. Uh, in uh, Korea by asymptote architects. Don't do this. A building is not a diagram. A building is not data. A building, um, uh, this has absolutely no relational value at all. And if you've been to this building, you would know what I mean. Don't do this. Although this is, in fact, Minecraft, which hasn't stopped architects from trying to do Minecraft buildings. I think this very slide was shown here. 
a couple of months back by, it's a, by shop architects. Um, oh, so here we go, don't do it. Don't do this. This is actually in my hometown, like a completely schizophrenic environment. There's the, there's the guy looking at the sun. Um, everyone, every, everything here doesn't know where anything else is. Do do this. I say yes to Scarpa here, to this beautiful um, uh, Belgian Art Nouveau facade by a no-name architect. It's almost impossible to find the name of this architect. There's nothing here you can't see the gracefulness of how water is collected, the diff these windows sloping down to the edge, um, this figure rising up in contradistinction to these descending lines, this beautiful leaping from side to side, the arms, the figures holding the brackets. These are things, the way this, this thing, no, this window knows that there's a molding here. That's what I, when a part of a building knows about another part of a building, okay, we're talking about a relational architecture. Um, Aldo van Eyck and his orphanage, I won't go into that. These insights were uh, Alison Peter Smithson at the CIAM. We're beginning to talk about this. Um, a window in uh, San Miguel, Mexico, a school in the same town. Scarpa's Castel Vecchio, the most beautiful placement of painting to the, the easel it might have been painted on or an abstraction of it to a window that sheds light on it. A more humble example of the same thing a building in my hometown, Austin, it's the power plant, the pump house of a power plant. <coughs> Just look at the how fantastically Khan works out at Dakar. These, a pair of rooms joined again at the corner. There's not a single geometry or part of this building that isn't aware of where it is in the plan or of how it's responding and reacting to the space uh, next to it. And yet every one of them has a dignity of its own. Every one of them is a human being, a building as a being. The result. My own sketches of, of a pair of rooms which are an IU relationship. So here we have a room, we have another room, we have a distinct boundary between them. This is me, this is you. I see from me into you, not all of you, and I see a world through your windows which is not the same as the world through my windows that those people can see. Okay? So we have two, we have two rooms in two worlds joined, mostly visible to each other. This is, I'm not suggesting we all go and do circular rooms, students, but this is a, this is a model for me for how two spaces can be like two beings. Thank you. <laughs>